Welcome to the NIHR Dementia Researcher podcast, brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk, in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world. Hello, my name's Louise Serple, and I'm really excited to be taking a turn at hosting the Dementia Researcher podcast today. Thank you all for tuning in to this week's show, where my guests and I will be sharing highlights from this week's British Neuroscience Association Festival. For those listeners who don't know me, I'm Professor of Biochemistry and a Director of Sussex Neuroscience um, at the University of Sussex. Um, And my research bridges neuroscience and biochemistry with a particular focus on protein misfolding and self-assembly. So uh, within this podcast, I'm going to try not to completely dominate uh, with all my exciting um, aspects of the BNA, which were um, about protein aggregation, um, looking at seeding and spreading in in Alzheimer's disease and other related diseases, particularly tauopathies. I really, really enjoyed um, the... um, the session on uh, traumatic brain injury, that was amazing and really fantastic, uh, really interesting connection with what we know about dementia and what we might know about sports and so on. So I'll, I'll try and fit in my own um, aspects, but what I first will, of all will do will be to let each of um, the guests that are here with me today um, introduce themselves. So I'm going to start off with um, Lilia. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Lilia Andrianova and it's my first ever podcast, so I'm quite excited and not ever so slightly nervous. Um, so I'm a postdoc at the Craig Lab and um, we're based at the University of Exeter at the moment, although I'm currently working for the University of Glasgow as my lab is making a slow transition up to Glasgow, um, but due to COVID we're sort of in between and everywhere at once and also nowhere. Um, And I'm not really a dementia person per se myself. So the lab does um, focus on some um, aspects of dementia, but my project at the moment is just general um, how things work in the brain. And I work with animals. Um, I'm a mouse researcher uh, and it's sort of a circuits based approach. Uh, So I look at the long range projections, especially I'm interested in the interplay between um, prefrontal cortex, hippocampus, uh, and the thalamus. Um, so that's me. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Delia. That is quite a long move, isn't it? One end of the country to the other. Really? So, uh, <laughs> all right. So, um, Sarah, would you like to introduce yourself next? Hi, I'm Sarah Gregory. I work in the Edinburgh Dementia Prevention Group at the University of Edinburgh. Um, I'm a part-time PhD student and I'm also a study coordinator in the group. Um, So for my PhD, I'm interested at looking at the risk that uh, stress and uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal or HPA axis abnormalities might play in mid and later life on your future development of Alzheimer's disease. Um, And I'm using cohort studies to understand uh, more about that topic and my study coordination job I manage um, projects that are midlife adults or slightly older aged adults who live without dementia but maybe have risk factors uh, and follow them up over time to understand more about how these risk factors play out. So that's really interesting Sarah that you're doing a part-time PhD and also a job at the same time that's quite unusual. Yeah Yeah. great. It's quite fun though to do they're kind of balanced together. So it works out quite well. It must be sort of hard to, to decide what you're going to do at each time, or is it, is there a, a complication in terms of doing that or, or do you find it quite easy um, to split the tasks? I did my master's part-time as well at UCL whilst I was working um, in a mental health trust on clinical trials. So I think I'm just used to multitasking and lots of diaries and calendars by now. So mm. it worked for me. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you very much. So I'm going to go next to Sylvia, who's also at the University of Sussex with me. Sylvia, do you want to say a bit about what you do? Yeah, sure. And hello, everyone. So I'm Sylvia Anderle. I'm a second year PhD student, uh, as Louise was saying, at the University of Sussex, where I also did my undergrad in neuroscience. And then I moved to London to study a master in dementia at the Queen's Square Institute of Neurology. But then after the master, I found out about this PhD opportunity. And so I came back to to Brighton, where I am now. And in my project, I investigate how physical exercise and the most common genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, which is APOE4, affect neurovascular coupling, which is the phenomenon by which a change in neuronal activity is matched by an increase in energy and oxygen supply through, through the blood. 
And to do so, I record neuronal and vessel responses in vivo using mice that possess a human APOE gene. And I link these to the amount of exercise that the mice do. Okay, thank you very much, Sylvia. That's fantastic. So um, we'll come back to you about neurovascular coupling later on. That would be great. Thank you. Um, so Emily next, would you like to tell us a bit about yourself? Hi, my name's Emily. I'm also in the second year of my PhD and I'm studying in the Centre for Clinical Brain Sciences at the University of Edinburgh. Um, so I also did my undergraduate degree at Edinburgh. I did psychology. And after that, I went on to work at the Unrolling Regenerative Neurology Clinic, which is based here in Edinburgh and was set up by JK Rowling after she lost her mother to complications from multiple cirrhosis. Um, so my work at the moment focuses on how we can support more people with motor neuron disease to get into clinical trials. Um, we're also looking at how we can use new digital health technologies to evaluate these motor symptoms and kind of look at how we can better assess the drugs in the clinical trials and really expand our concept of what is treatment in a clinical trial. Thank you very much, Emily. That sounds fantastic. Um, and um, lastly, but not least, um, Annika, would you like to tell us about yourself? Yeah. Hi, Louise. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, so my name is Annika Bolt and I am a Sir Henry Wellcome Postdoctoral Fellow. Um, I'm based at University College London at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience. Um, and I am actually a, um, an experimental psychologist by training. And in my research, I um, investigate metacognition. And metacognition, um, for those of you who don't know, it means thinking about your own thoughts. So it's all of these little moments or signals in the brain, when we feel confident about something we've done, about a choice, when we detect errors in our own behavior. So this can be very low level and kind of more perceptual levels, or when we represent uncertainty in any way about our own beliefs. Um, and I study these insight signals in the healthy human adult brain. And I use behavior paradigms like these button clicking tasks. Um, I use fMRI and EEG and computational modeling. Thank you very much, Annika. So um, what I'm going to do next is I'd, I'd like to um, invite each one of our, my guests today to tell us a bit about the BNA conference. It ran from Monday to Thursday and it, um, I mean, there was a lot to, to um, engage in um, and enjoy. Um, and so I'll start with Lilia. If you could tell me what, what were your highlights of the meeting? Well, so it was my first conference that was happening virtually completely. Um, and it was on a special platform um, and you had all these extra um, extra bits and bobs for it. So you could message people. I don't know if it's I'm really this excited about this because it's my first virtual one. So I'm completely sort of a novice uh, coming into this or maybe you guys uh, have seen it in other conferences as well. And and actually, that's kind of the norm now. But I thought it was really um quite handy to be able to find the people you've spoken to because I'm terrible with names. So I always end up speaking to people at posters and then never finding them again and never actually am able to make that connection. So I thought that was really great to be able to um, speak to people um, afterwards as well. In terms of highlights, all the sessions I thought were super interesting. I'm still catching up on a lot of them um, just because there are too many happening at the same time that I couldn't um, make but luckily um, because they're keeping all the sessions up for I think about four months um, so yeah I'm still very keen to attend a few more sessions I think my favorite plenary lecture um, was I think the Wednesday one um, and it was by I do apologize if I butchered the name uh, but um, Amita Segal um, she works in Drosophila um, and the lecture was on uh, glia cells and their involvement in sleep in Drosophila. Um, and actually started off with this amazing factoid that I feel everyone should know about, that Drosophila um, flies and they are like human, they sleep at nighttime and they're awake at daytime, but some of them, especially male ones, like to take a siesta nap. Um, and if you take nothing else from that lecture, just that one bit, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful piece of uh, knowledge to have for everybody. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you. That's it's such a nice, um, yeah, reference to our lives as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so um, if I come to you next, Sarah, um, what was what did you enjoy the most about this meeting? Yeah, I would definitely agree with Lilia that it was a really good platform. I've been to one other conference, I think, online, um, and I just thought some of the networking stuff was actually really cool on this and it made it a lot easier for 
early career researchers to kind of ask questions and things, whereas in a big hall, I might not go up to a microphone and ask. So I thought that was really good. Um, my, I had quite a few that I was trying to choose from to, to speak about today, uh, but I think I'm gonna go with the prenatal exposure session. Um, and one thing I really liked about the uh, kind of breakout sessions was there was a real mixture of clinical studies and preclinical animal work and maybe um, kind of more data focused projects. It was really interesting to learn about it. Uh, the one from that session that really stuck with me was Suzanne de Roy, who's uh, at the UMC in Amsterdam. Um, and she spoke about the Dutch famine birth cohort. So this is a group of people whose mums were pregnant during the famine in the Netherlands um, around kind of Second World War time. And the famine lasted for five to six months, but before and after the population was really well fed. So a really interesting group to study. So they had kind of over 2000 babies who uh, were kind of in gestation before, during, and then after. Um, and the mum had at least 13 weeks where she had less than a thousand calories. And then they followed them up when they're older. So they took 750 people when they were in their late fifties and looked at their cognitive function. And the people who um, had, whose mums had been pregnant with them during the famine, they did a lot worse on the Stroop test compared to those babies whose mums were pregnant before or after the famine. And then they looked at MRI scans 10 years later, so their late sixties. And they only found this in men, which was interesting, but they men whose mums were pregnant during the famine had lower brain volume, they had a higher brain age and they had reduced cerebral blood flow. So it's, I just thought that was kind of a fascinating, really unique study in a country where you wouldn't necessarily associate famine or nutritional deficits where they've been able to use this to understand what might um, be kind of the lifelong implications of this malnutrition during such an important development period. Um, so yeah, that was a fascinating talk for me. I, that's really interesting. I actually didn't, re I mean, embarrassingly, I, I'm ignorant that I didn't know that there was a famine in the, in the Netherlands, but- I didn't know. Um, yeah. And I wonder, I mean, that's, it's interesting, isn't it, that you, you'd think during development that the brain would be prioritized and that mm -hmm. you'd, you might think that it would be not affected by a, um, a lack of nutrition, whereas the, maybe the rest of the body would be, but that's really interesting that that wasn't the case. Yeah. So fascinating. And yeah, an unfortunate event that then leads to some really interesting research. Thank you very much, Sarah. So, um, should we go next to Sylvia? Um, what did you enjoy the most? And I, I do encourage you to talk about the neurovascular coupling session, which I did, haven't managed to watch <laughs> yet as well as whatever your highlight might be. I also wanted to say, um, that I also found this platform to be quite good for networking and for being able to connect with uh, other people. And I think I was actually able to witness the uh, power of actually doing these online conferences because I was able to connect with people that were literally on the other side of the world that were doing similar research to me. And I thought that was very, very nice compared to other conferences that I went to. And I didn't really feel like I was connected with anyone. Um, and so I, I really liked this. And then, of course, as you were saying, I should mention the neurovascular coupling session. And this was very, very interesting for me, obviously, because I do my research on neurovascular coupling. And actually, uh, my supervisor, who is uh, Dr. Catherine Hall, she was given one of the talks during the session. And she was um, presenting about some findings from our lab, especially um, collected data from uh, uh, Dr. Kira Shaw, and will be that will be published soon. And what we found is that uh, there are some differences in the, um, between the mouse visual cortex and hippocampus in terms of energy and oxygen supply. And um, with the hippocampus showing lower blood flow and lower blood oxygenation. Um, weaker neurovascular function and decreased expression of vascular markers, indicating therefore that the hippocampus might be more vul vulnerable to conditions such as hypoxia and neuronal damage. So, of course, this talk was uh, quite quite interesting. And and then there were also the other speakers that gave very amazing talks during the, the session, um, in particular, Dr. Claire Howard from the University of Sheffield. Um, she spoke about 
how in their lab they uh, managed to uh, selectively activate NNOS interneurons using optogenetics. And they saw that this activation leads to a large increase in um, vascular response in the area, although these neurons don't really activate more. And this has um, implications in terms of uh, the, the translation of these studies in humans, because with the fMRI bold signal, um, which is based on the, on the vascular response to neuronal activation, if, um, if there are interneurons that drive a, a major increase in vascular flow to the area, but is not linked to the to an increase in activity of the neurons, then we have to take this into account. And then uh, another very, very interesting talk was from Professor David Atwill from UCL, who uh, talked about uh, their findings in the lab on um, parasites in Alzheimer's disease. And uh, for those of you who don't know what parasites are, they are neural cells of the capillaries, which drive constriction and dilation in the capillary bed. And what they found is that in Alzheimer's disease mice, these parasites are uh, constricted, uh, leading to um, a constriction of the capillaries. And they also uh, did very similar, uh, they also looked at the parasites in COVID-19 mice and, and what, they, uh, what they saw actually in hamsters. And they saw that parasites uh, in COVID-19 capillaries are also uh, constricted, um, leading therefore to a, a decrease in um, the blood flow to, to the capillary bed. So he was basically saying that targeting this capillary constriction might be uh, a therapeutic um, uh, target for Alzheimer's disease and also for the long-term effects of COVID-19. So I think this was the take-home message and I thought it was very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, you are allowed to have other highlights as well if you would like to introduce any other, anything else. Of course, neurofascular coupling is going to be the most interesting thing for you, but was there anything else that you found to be really interesting? We can come uh, back to you afterwards. Yes, sure. I mean, it was a very interesting conference and there were so many relevant sessions that were, uh, it was almost impossible to decide which one to attend, to be fair. Um, I think another session that was quite relevant for uh, Alzheimer's disease and which happened on the first day uh, on the Monday uh, was the lived experience with dementia session. I don't know if any of you uh, saw it. And I thought it was a, a very, very powerful and moving session and very motivating for, for people like me that work in, uh, that do research in Alzheimer's disease. And this session was hosted by Professor Nick Fox from the UCL DRI. And um, basically um, was also co-hosted by Sophie Le Leggett, who uh, basically shared her um, experience of having a fam family history of familial Alzheimer's disease. And uh, she shared the story of how in her family, um, everyone started to develop symptoms at the age of, uh, around the age of 40 and how, um, there was a stigma associated with it. So no one was really talking about it. Like her mom was not talking about it or her nan. And even, and, and because of this, when her mom started having the first symptoms of Alzheimer's disease at 40, she also initially, uh, refused to, uh, acknowledge what was happening. But then she said that when she was encouraged by her family members to actually head to Queen Square and learn more about what having familial Alzheimer's disease implicates, that's when her life changed and her way of seeing life changed. And since then, she took part in a large number of cognitive tests and she she basically decided to collaborate as much as she could uh, to um, to better the understanding in uh, uh, familial Alzheimer's disease. And then um, what I thought was also quite moving was when she talked about uh, her experience of getting the genetic test 
because uh, initially she didn't want to get tested because of the um, implications of getting uh, the results back. And if it was positive, it was going to change her life forever. And she has also a daughter, so it had implications for her daughter. So she she talked about how initially she didn't want to take the test and then her thinking behind it and how she reacted after she she got the results of the test. And then finally, and then I'll I'll conclude and I don't want it to take too much time. Um, I think what was uh, important for us as researchers was was what she said was the take home message uh, for for the researchers watching the session. And she said that we have to remember that for every bit of data that we analyze and that we are so fully invested that we are invested in, we have to remember that there are people that are fully invested in those data with their life. And that basically, even though maybe the clinical trials are not very encouraging at the moment, every little bit of data will go towards making the life of people with Alzheimer's disease better. And I think that was um, very, very important um, to hear because I feel that sometimes we focus so much on the on the publication or maybe getting some rejections and we don't actually remember that we are working to make the life of a lot of people better. Thank you, Sylvia, because I was re- I'm really glad you brought that one up because I also saw that and I, I really enjoyed it. It was incredibly moving. Um, and um, there were a couple of things that really stood out for me. There was one um, point when she mentioned that she goes through all these tests. She does lumbar punctures and cognitive tests and things. And she said that her and her um, sort of support group, and there are lots of other people people who she knows who are in a similar sort of position. I think that's really important having those support groups. She said that they really hate doing the cognitive tests when they have to test their memory. They find that really, really difficult. And they'd rather, she said, I'd rather have a lumbar puncture than a cognitive test, which yeah, is pretty, (laughs) pretty shocking to hear when you think actually it's of course not invasive, but just having that sort of test and her sort of second guessing whether she's got worse or better is just Mm. must be incredibly difficult. And I completely agree with you. I think um, it was really important to have that included in the BNA because I think to be reminded of why we're working on what we're working on is really, really helpful for us. And to be reminded of why we're doing the science is incredible. You know, it's not about prizes, of course. It is about, you know, us finding out new things and and potentially making a difference, which I think is really important. So um, so thank you really very much, um, Sylvia. So um, I'll go next to Emily, if I may. And Emily, do you want to tell us a bit about what you enjoyed the most in the BNA meeting? Yeah, of course. I mean, like we've all said, it's all been kind of a lot to choose from and definitely a lot of catching up to do but too much choice is always a good thing so the uh, lecture that I found probably the most interesting to me was the one that kicked off the whole thing so we started off with the brain resilience to pathology which was chaired by Tara Spire Jones and then my particular favorite within that one was by Professor Brain from Cambridge and um, who then presented their work from the Medical Research Council on the Cognitive Aging Study. So this was a population-based neuropathology study involving 550 brain donations, but they'd also got some questionnaire and um, live data from these people before they passed away from dementia. So I found this particularly interesting because to me, it kind of defined to me what a good science talk is. It had a good story. We had a good, clear objective, and we also had some kind of little bits of extra knowledge and also some very clear testable hypotheses. And then the results of that, we could see how it would have implications in the future. So we started off by looking at how dementia had changed over time. So we looked a little bit at how the population-based registers were informing us about how incidence and prevalence had changed over time, because there's quite a lot of narrative about you know, there's an aging population, dementia is increasing, we need to be concerned. Whereas actually, when we started looking at the data and professors explaining it quite well of how the population is aging, but actually the rates are staying kind of similar. Um, 
which I thought was quite interesting because it does dispel that kind of myth of, you know, we're all going to get dementia, that kind of problem. But while still expressing that it is a population based problem, then we also went on to think a bit more about the uh, Medical Research Council study itself. So we presented two hypotheses, which again were very clear, very testable. So, first of all, we looked at the pathology in the brain. So the variable was higher education. So would this higher education be able to compensate for the pathological burden of dementia? So was it neuroprotective, um, including the less pathology in the brain? Or would it also be that they were better able to cope with pathology that was existing, this concept of compensation? So I found it quite helpful to consider that as two separate hypotheses and also see how they were testable and how they were disproved. So the study found that there was no evidence of neuroprotection. So the pathology in these two individuals, hypothetical group A, hypothetical group B, was similar. So having a higher education did not stop the changes in pathology in the brain. However, the clinical manifestation was less severe. So this does have big implications for when we're talking to patients in clinic. So this lower education, these two hypothetical patients may be presenting with similar levels of pathological burden, but it's about how they can cope with that pathological burden. Thinking about that, that reserve, that cognitive reserve, that resilience to pathology, which I thought was very interesting. And then we also thought about how this has implications for policy which I think was very good and well done in the talk. It didn't overreach. Um, she explained it very clearly. You know, this is something that we can change. Education is a modifiable risk factor. As a society, we have a responsibility to change those modifiable risk factors. Even if it's not the only risk factor, what have we got to lose? You know, we can always improve things like that. So, yeah, I think that was definitely my highlight of the talks. Thanks very much, Emily. That's, it sounds fascinating. I didn't hear that one. So thank you very much. Um, it was really good assessment of that. Um, I also think you, you may have gone to the ECR um, networking, career networking, what they called speed dating um, yes. session. And yeah, I think Sarah did too. So, Emily, do you want to start? And then I'll come to Sarah and then I'll finally go to Annika. Yeah, go of ahead. course. Um, I had a really good um, experience of that. I would definitely say that was a highlight for me of the careers. And it was Having been to quite a few virtual conferences, that was a really unique opportunity. And it can be quite intimidating to just approach people and also not really know where to start um, with what jobs people do and things like that. So as I'm in the second year of my PhD and starting to look ahead, what do I want to do? What do I want to do careers-wise? So I was really excited about the opportunity to have these short little speed dating sessions, just one-to-one, well, two-to-one of two uh, researchers one um well it kind of depended but mine was a PI and an industry researcher and um, spoke to them you know it's a very informal environment it's just a chat we heard a little bit more about what they did on a day-to-day kind of lifted that that veil of what do you actually do in your job um and what I found was it was nice to get that little bit of honesty of being like you know there's parts that I struggle with there's parts that I enjoy what do you like doing as a person and think about how your career can fit into that. Um, and the people that I spoke to were just absolutely lovely and we've already emailed with additional questions and support and advice. So big thank you for the mentorship. It sounds really good. And, uh, and something you would think that would be a good thing to keep including in these sorts of conferences. Yeah. Definitely. It would be something I would recommend because it's yeah. just nice to have that little like mentorship role outside of your group. And particularly with talking to industry researchers, when you work in academia, that's just not really as easy to do. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, the, us academics are sort of biased because we don't have any experience of anything else, really. We're sort of <laughs> narrow and we don't know how to do anything else, essentially. So, and Sarah, how did you find the, that session? Uh, yeah, same as um, Emily, I thought they were so useful and I would love to see them at this conference again and at more conferences. I chose two industry people um, because I felt like I know a little bit about the academic path through people uh, kind of in our group or I would 
maybe know a little bit more about who I could go and ask about, okay, how would you get to this position? So I spoke to someone who was in research and development in a company and someone who was in the charity sector. And it was just so interesting to hear about their paths, kind of why they made the decision to go out of academia. They had PhDs, they'd completed, they did varying levels of postdocs before deciding to move on. Um, the kind of skill sets that you're building up that are really, really valued by industry and what kind of a a job outside of academia might look like and what opportunities there are there. And both of them were um, kind of saying you're not leaving science if you leave academia. You know, we're still at these conferences. You just do it in a different way and you're engaging in a different way. So it was just fascinating to learn about different opportunities that are out there once the PhD is finished and you're looking for other opportunities. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was fantastic. Really interesting. I could have done with that myself, I think. Um, so um, I'm going to come next to Annika. Um, and Annika gave a talk at the conference. So um, I'm going to encourage her to talk a bit about um, what she talked about and also to give her highlights. So Annika, what would you like to tell us about? Um, yeah, so I might start off telling you a bit more about the symposium I co-chaired. Um, so this was actually the first time for me to um, invite my own speakers for a symposium. I did this together with a colleague and friend, Lucy Shards, who's also at the um, Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience at UCL. Um, and we hosted the Dynamics of Decision-Making and Metacognition session on Monday afternoon, which was kindly sponsored by the Experimental Psychology Society, the EPS. Um, and uh, it has been a really good experience, I must say. Um, I wish I'd done this sooner. It's it, Imagine me like picking my favorite speakers for a talk. It's a bit like kid in a candy shop. And you just like, go around your papers or your emails and you just start contacting people, asking them to come. And um, this is one of these moments where COVID has been a bit of a silver lining because we had one speaker whom we really wanted to invite, who in uh, an initial round, when we were still thinking this conference would go ahead and Brighton said, no, he couldn't fly across the globe. And then when we knew it was online, we contacted him again and said, look, we don't want to put you on a spot, but your excuse is kind of invalid now. So would you like to come and talk? And he said, yeah. Yes, so that, that's been amazing. Um, and what we wanted to do is bring some um, experts together on um, uh, a slightly new view on um, the metacognition research. So um, uh, sampling or dynamic view on decision making is quite common in the literature. So nowadays, the decision models that most people use are models that assume that evidence gets accumulated over time in the brain. Um, for example, you make a choice whether a traffic light is red or green, um, you're going to um, accumulate information until it is sufficient and you can say it's green, for example. Um, but confidence um, in the history of medical research has been probably seen as a, a little more static measure. Um, but this is changing. Like recently, people start to think about the same kind of frameworks when they think about how confident people are, or how they detect their own mistakes. Um, and we really like this flexible view on, on our field and our questions. So we wanted to host a symposium that, that um, focuses on that. And um, by flexibility, I mean both in terms of situations, like how does the brain adopt different biases depending on what choice context I'm in or decision-making uh, conference context, but also um, within a single decision, um, what are the evidence sources to sample from when I say how sure I am that I... Um, answered a question correctly, for example. Um, and uh, we had, including ourselves, we had two other speakers. So we started off um, uh, hearing a talk from my co-chair, Lucy. Um, and uh, Lucy Charles, she talked about um, a really neat framework of hers um, uh, where she uh, explained how people tend to adopt different confidence biases. Um, so confidence bias is a tendency to work over or underconfident. Um, and then uh, next, um, Brian Maniscalco um, from University of California, Irvine, um, presented um, some really elegant work um, where he links cognitive findings um, to low level brain implementation. To me, it's low level. To some of you, it might not be low level. Um, uh, in this case, uh, he explained uh, how choices can. Um, uh, <clears throat> 
can uh, are often uh, sorry choices are often based on a balanced review of the available evidence um, whereas for confidence it's different very often um, people disregard or discard some of the things they know some of the evidence they have accumulated and he links this to tuned inhibition in other words um, in his model choices are being read out from neuron populations that receive more input from each other so they're more um, tuned um, have more tuned inhibition um, and therefore they represent something like an average um, evidence and confidence instead is more focused on the absolute evidence. So it's from urine populations that have less tuned inhibition. Um, very interesting uh, work and uh, it links very nicely to a consistent finding from the literature that confidence tends to be based on decision congruent evidence. So people have a bit of a confirmation bias. Then my take uh, to a talk uh, came on and I find exactly the opposite in my data. <laughs> so I was a bit bold and chose to present these findings directly after Brian, I told him in advance. Um, and uh, we had a really dis good discussion about um, why I might be finding the exact opposite thing in my data in uh, like nine data sets very consistently. And um, we're thinking about some future works and how to disentangle this further. And then finally, um, we had um, some really interesting non-human primate data from uh, Chris Fetch from uh, Baltimore, um, John Hopkins. And um, uh, it's it's quite tricky to do metacognition research in monkeys, as you might imagine. Um, so very often people use these clever opt-out paradigms where when the monkey is unsure, um, it's taught to not respond at all. Um, but there's some disadvantages to this. And Chris's lab is really great at replacing these paradigms um, with more explicit confidence ratings. So the monkey is taught to um, say how sure, unsure they are by um, uh, making a, a sacket. And um, Chris was showing uh, some really interesting data that showed that a signal that could be interpreted as a population code for uncertainty. So yeah, I really en enjoyed co-chairing that with Lucy. That was also one of my highlights, I must say. <laughs> I can really um, underline the fun in organizing um, a symposium, it's it really is fun, and I really encourage everybody to do that because you know, people you know and people that you've enjoyed their talks is really, really entertaining. And, and then you make basically your perfect, your own perfect symposium that every single talk will be fascinating for you. So it's great fun. Um, Annika, was there anything else you wanted to highlight that you enjoyed? Um, yeah, maybe I take this opportunity to um, speak about a more methods based uh, session I went to because I always try to do this when I go to conferences as a, um, a researcher more interested in fundamental science. Um, I try to go to developmental talk, to clinical, to a method space, just to sample a little bit. And the um, methods one I went to was the, um, the R workshop on Monday morning. Um, uh, I'm an R user myself. You could call me almost a religious R user. So I skipped the earlier um, talks about the introduction to R. Um, but uh, at the end, I think the last two talks, um, uh, one was held by Jorge um, Kivit from Dondas. Um, and he showed how R could be used for multivariate statistics. Um, and I must admit, I still use MATLAB for all my multivariate analyses. I really want to move away from that. So that was a really good kind of pointer. Um, he introduced an, a package called Levan, which to me, it sounded a bit like a Swiss army knife of our statistics. Um, so I'm going to look into that for sure. And then uh, the last talk was by Rick Hansen from, from University of Cambridge. Um, and he uh, explained how R could be used for Bayesian analysis. Um, I already do that a lot in my research. So I use R for Bayesian stats. But what I was what I really liked was that he presented a, a, like a financial argument for why you should use Bayesian statistics, which was a simulation for a fictional fMRI experiment. And he showed how the costs were dropping as soon as you adopted a Bayesian sampling approach. Uh, so of course, very convincing and impressive. <laughs> Thank you very much, Annika. That I, I think the methods ones are really useful, in particular, um, in particular for sort of just um, helping us to understand the, the the experts in those fields. And often, you know, those 
those sorts of people are, are working away avidly, you know, doing all of the methods development stuff and don't necessarily get to talk about their work very often because it's not going to perhaps get into nature and so on. So it's really, really important to give those sorts of people a platform, I think. So, yeah, really good I, good suggestions. So I just wanted to talk about my um, my favourite um, talk, which was a plenary lecture by um, Bart Streeper. Um, he was talking about amyloid um, and tau in Alzheimer's disease. And I, I followed his work for a long time because he works on um, amyloid beta processing. And that's something I'm really interested in. Um, and I'd heard him speak before about amyloid beta as a target for therapy um, and how drug companies shouldn't abandon it because potentially some of the drugs that they have actually produced may well work. It's just that people aren't being treated early enough. Um, and he showed some really interesting work where he has um, been working with human cells that he had, uh, that human neurons implanted into an animal model so that he could look at Alzheimer's disease in humans, but using an animal model, which I guess perhaps the um, you know, the popular news press might have a problem with, but, you know, it's a, a really exciting initiative. Um, and at the end of the talk, he was talking about how they were going to introduce microglia as well. So human microglia with human neurons and just, uh, you know, a really innovative, interesting way of looking at Alzheimer's disease. Um, and he showed some really nice data that suggested that um, amyloid beta um, it's, it's sort of supported views that people had talked about before where amyloid beta plaques um, seem to initiate the aggregation of tau. So being able to show that in a sort of temporal manner. Um, and it sort of helps to explain that famous nun study. I don't know if any of you know about this, but you know it's always brought up as the idea to um, underline why amyloid beta isn't important because um, there were nuns who had um, died and didn't have have any um, dementia but were shown to have lots and lots of amyloid and then people who had dementia then they didn't show lots of amyloid so there didn't seem to be a good correlation essentially between the pathology and the and the level of dementia um, but what he showed here was that people can have amyloid or or the model system can have amyloid and in some model systems you get tau aggregation and some you don't so it really seemed to be about the the body's response to the amyloid deposition rather than necessarily the amyloid itself. So I think that's fascinating, you know, thinking about how the body responds in terms of inflammation, in terms of other sort of misfolding and so on. It just seemed really exciting. And I sort of want to add one thing, which is um, comes from my experience of imposter syndrome at the lot, just before I move on, which is that, um, you know, listening to this talk by um, Bart Struper really made me think that perhaps I should give up doing science and just let him do it because he was so am really amazing. Um, and then I let a day or two go by and instead of feeling like that anymore, I now just feel inspired to uh, carry on working on it in my own little niche area of it, you know, and, and hopefully contribute something. So, you know, it, however small, um, in the whole scheme of everything. So um, on, on that um, note, I will now move on to Lilia. Um, do you want to tell us if you were going to um, suggest to somebody what, I, I think this is the question I want to ask you all really, is if you were going to say to somebody um, what you would really recommend that they watched in the BNA alongside perhaps the things you've already highlighted, what would you, what would you pick? I think just to follow on from what um, you were talking about and improving on our current models for dementia um, and using both um, animals as models and, and adding um, human cells and sort of trying to make a better model to, to actually study um, Alzheimer's, for example. Um, I so, and I guess I'll tie it in with what I would recommend for people to do. Um, and that's something I'm going to go back and do myself is look through all the posters again and um, make use of the messenger system that we still have to see if I can still chat to the people who um, presented. Because actually for, as it always happens for me, um, symposia and uh, plenary lectures are super interesting and really fun. But I actually almost that 
a sort of one-on-one -on -one or small group um, talking that you get uh, end up having when you're at a poster session, I think can be just as stimulating, just as interesting to you as a researcher. So I went to one of the posters uh, by a colleague that works, uh, I think at UCL, um, and their work is in ferrets. And, and they were comparing some of the, it's sort of electrophysiology, so my up my street, um, they were comparing ferrets with rats and there's quite a lot of uh, difference. And we sort of ended up having this a super long chat about species specific things and how, um, as with most diseases, we need better models for things. And especially so with dementia, seeing as the clinical trials aren't, um, overly promising um, at the moment and it's possibly because we aren't, haven't quite found the best uh, models that we could. Um, and I think my sort of take home message from that interaction was that as researchers, we end up um, a little bit stuck in our ways. So you sort of get trained in a set of techniques and you think this is what I do. Um, so I primarily work with rodents. So that's my go to, well, that's what I do, but it's so, um, really quite is quite inspiring almost to look at what other species and what other science can be done using other models and to be able to think about um, whether or not your techniques are actually best placed to answer the questions that you are posing for yourself and I think that goes back to um, what Louise was saying that we need we need to sort of almost think outside of the box um, um, for for the future experiments. Um, so I think that that'd be my sort of um, advice to anyone. Uh, just look at all the posters and also look at the things that you wouldn't normally think you'd go to just because you sort of think that perhaps they aren't quite um, exactly what you do. But sometimes I think it's the best thing. Go to the thing that seems most distant to what you've done and you'll definitely find some, some commonalities there still. Thank you, Lilia. And that's really important because we haven't mentioned any posters yet. And I think that that can be um, it's it's probably the part that I really miss about um, having an online meeting, because what I tend to do at posters is sort of wander around and then um, get people to explain their poster to me, because I find just reading them quite tricky, especially if you're sort of standing there with all your stuff and everything. Um, and I think I really missed that. And I'm, I haven't quite got to the stage where I feel like online that I'm able to really look at the posters in a, a in an effective way. So I think having them highlighted is a, a great way. Actually, there was a flash presentation set of flash presentations wasn't there were there? some rapid talks and yeah if anyone is interested mine was part of it i think that was at the start yeah i think those are great so did you do one of those as well emily yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. just the little data blitz session i think they're happen. really helpful um because you know people like me are just sort of rushing about and trying to do everything at once and just having that little snippet is really helpful and i think what people remarked about that was that you know, the, the presentations were s such high quality, really impressive. I think Sylvia did one as well, didn't you, Sylvia? Yes, yeah. yes, I did. Yeah, because yeah. because it, you managed to get into such a short amount of time, a huge amount of work, of course, and, and it is an opportunity to highlight what you've done. I think that that's really helpful. Did any of you get any sort of feedback from that? Did anyone come to your posters because they'd seen your flash talk or...? Because I think those work really well in a real environment because people can come up to you at coffee and have a chat about your flash talk. Lily, do you want to say something? And then I'll go to Sylvia. So um, Yeah, I did. Um, because my um, my actual presentation was on, I think, Wednesday, but the uh, rapid fire talks were uh, Monday right at the start of the conference. So I, I had a few questions coming in on Monday and actually I sort of ended up meeting up with one or two people before my poster presentation on the back of the uh, the rapid fire talk. So I think it was really, really useful for sort of, uh, for more people to just to see your stuff, yeah. Yeah, so you you say definitely do those when they 
when the opportunity occurs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, it's um, a bit painful. Um, I, I I was a bit worried because you know presenting, and I, I think most scientists aren't really that comfortable with presenting at any given opportunity. So we all sort of a little bit like, oh, I'm not sure. Um, so I sort of had to push myself through it. But um, but I, yeah, I think those are great. And even if you're scared of doing it, you should just say yes anyway. Yeah, absolutely right. So Sylvia, did you get some responses? Yes, so exactly uh, as Lily was saying, um, I think that because of the rapid uh, presentation that uh, I, I guess a lot of people must have watched, then those that were interested in my research uh, probably decided to come to the poster because I also had some people that um, emailed me on the on the Monday. So um so yes, I think it's a good opportunity. Great. All right. So um, I think that we um, probably are um, running out of time. So I think what I'm going to do is just come to each one of you and get you to just mention what would you recommend if if somebody doesn't have very much time and they've just got to quickly dip into BNA. And I'm going to uh, go in a different direction now because I'm going to come to Annika first. I, I, this is really difficult. There are so many highlights, but I think if, if I could name only one thing, it would be um, Heidi Jerns and Burke's talk. Um, and um, I don't know whether anybody else saw this. Um, it's very interesting. It was a BACN mid-career prize lecture. Um, and it was a very interesting summary of all the great work that she has done to this day. And um, it was a really nice mixture of uh, fundamental research and then also the translational aspects. So up to clinical studies, she showed a really, really lovely finding of stroke patients who underwent um, anodal TTCS, so brain stimulation, and they ended up with uh, lasting benefits to their rehabilitation journey. And I, yeah. I think that's it's very nice to tie all these things together. You know, she does that um, so brilliantly. Thank you very much, Annika. Um, and Emily, what, what would you recommend? Um, I think my final comment would definitely be focused on the posters aspect. So one thing that I found that was really interesting and unique about the BNA conference was that you could submit a pre-registration poster. Um, so and. We, we, we decided to do that. It was accepted. We did it for the data blitz. So you give us a short summary of the study that you're currently running at the moment. And um, so we brought our factors that impact trial participation in motor neuron disease. So this kind of study is ideal for the pre-registration environment in that we're studying a cohort and then we're waiting 12 months to come back and look at the data. So in this case, looking at did they participate in a clinical trial? So this was something that I really liked about the pre-registration is that you can read work that is happening right now. So a benefit of conferences generally is that you're finding out about research that's happening, just happened, but you can go even more recent in the pre-registration. So you're finding out what's actually being done, finding out what the new developments are, you're finding out what this preliminary data is without that kind of time delay that we often have from academic publishing. Oh, I hadn't actually heard about that. So that's really fascinating. So, and and have you had people come back to you about the pre-registration or do you think that that's something people will, will be really excited about the next BNA because they'll get to hear the results? No, I, I don't think it was taken up on as much as I thought it would be. When I was looking through the posters, I was quite surprised that there weren't more pre-registration. It was people were tending to lean towards the, um, you know, the traditional format of publishing before they'd done a manuscript but um yeah I thought that was a really interesting opportunity is because like especially with bench work science it is really like you know you're looking at something almost in real time which is very interesting mm. and maybe it's going to take a little bit of time for people to get used to the idea of it so yeah yeah, yeah. So, Sylvia, is there something that you'd like to highlight that if people had a short amount of time to look at um, BNA? Yes. So, um, I think I'm I'm just going to highlight quickly two uh, sessions. So, the first one is not like a, a sciencey session per se. 
but it was the session called Steps Towards Decolonizing Teaching and Learning in Neuroscience. I thought it was really, really relevant. And especially um, one of the speakers was the associate professor, Yvonne Mbaki from the University of Nottingham. And she explained the uh, framework that uh, her and her colleague um, created for the steps to follow to um, start this decolonizing uh, approach um, of academia. And this framework is available uh, for uh, like everyone in, in, in science to, to take up. And uh, basically it consists of like four major steps. So it's changing the teaching material. So making sure that the teaching material uh, is inclusive and that you don't use, for example, uh, knowledge um, that came from uh, studies that were done back in the days that like were were racist because maybe they, they uh, used participants that were not ethically uh, taking part in the study. So the choice of teaching material is really important and also um, knowledge production. So who is um, giving the lectures and make sure to involve like as many uh, teachers, lecturers that are like from like d diverse backgrounds as possible. And then um, the history of the subject, as I was saying, making sure that the 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 resources that you are uh, teaching are were ethically um, achieved and then uh, tackling the current inequalities so teaching the students about what uh, not just about racism but also what microaggressions are and um so i think of course there are way more details to this um that I, I encourage everyone to look up, uh, but the good thing is that this framework is available for for everyone to for all other universities to actually take up and apply. And indeed, there was also a Professor Sarah Guthrie from the University of Sussex that was explaining how as Sussex we are um, taking steps towards this and also um, there was Associate Professor Becky Truman from the University of Nottingham, who was also saying how they are uh, using this framework and applying it uh, to teach a neuroscience uh, at the University of Nottingham. So I think this, this session was really relevant. And then just briefly, um, I just wanted to mention the session um, that was on Wednesday about non-neuronal cells in neurological disease. I thought that was very interesting because um, I think that sometimes we, we focus a lot um, of our attention on neurons, but as actually Louise, you were saying, and uh, Professor Bardo Struper uh, said in his talk, uh, glial, glial cells play a very important role. So um, I encourage everyone to go and, and watch this session because um, there are there are quite um, a, all the talks are very interesting. And uh, so I I really recommend it. Thank you very much, Sylvia. So, Sarah. Well, very weirdly, I was basically just going to echo what Emily had said anyway. Um, so resilience to pathology was the other session that I was kind of deciding between as my highlight. So I would definitely recommend checking that one out. I thought all of the talks in that were so interesting, but particularly the one by Professor Carol Brain. Um, and then uh, the pre-registration posters as well. So we'd submitted a pre-registration poster looking at our speech study to collect data remotely over the phone to see if speech might be a biomarker of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so yeah, Edinburgh think may be exactly what Emily's already said and recommended. I think those would be my two kind of um, highlights from the festival. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So I just want to mention a couple of things that I very much enjoyed. And uh, I mean, the um, there was a session on Thursday that was about dementia, sports and traumatic brain injury, which I, I thought was fascinating. It was run um, entirely by clinicians. So um, it had been set up by David Sharp, who I think was running the session with William Stewart, Eliza Zanier and Neil Graham. And they all talked about um, their work looking at um, the outcome of traumatic brain injury and showing that, you know, relatively small um, um, 
knocks to the head essentially um, can have quite an, a severe impact and they were looking at um, how we might be able to diagnose that in terms of you know rugby players for example who've had um, mild um, bumps so I'm not talking about concussion but bumps and then they can look at the level of neurofilament light in the um, in the blood and also um, the formation of phosphorylated tau um, and so on um, and talking about just you know the impact of that in terms of how we we make sport um, safer but really I, I thought really fascinating um, and um, early on Monday when there were three sessions all at the same time that I wanted to go to um, I went to protein spread and seeding which was um, the, uh, one of the speakers was Luc Boué and they uh, from Lille in France and they were talking essentially about how um, how different um, proteins in disease spread throughout the brain and, and trying to understand that in a bit more detail. So um, it was a really well put together session because it had um, tau, it had alpha-synuclein, and then it had prion. And prions obviously are sort of the model for trying to understand how seeding works um, and the suggestion that you sort of can have infection between um, individuals. Um, but of course, what we're talking about here is spreading within the brain of an individual and looking at how that transmission of protein misfolding um, happens between cell to cell and spreads throughout the brain. So really, um, really, really interesting. Um, so I think well, I'm going to draw to a close here. Um, and um, I just want to um, thank everyone who came today for sharing. Um, if you um, attended this conference um, and missed any of the talks, I hope that we've highlighted some of them and you can go and watch them on catch up. But if you didn't book and couldn't and can't access those presentations, I hope that our summaries today have been interesting and given you a bit of pause for thought, um, some other things that you might want to go ahead and look up. I'm sure if you look, take a look at Twitter with the hashtag BNA2021, you'll find lots of discussion and pictures of the posters that you missed. Um, and it's time to end today's podcast recording and I'd just really like to thank um, our panellists Sarah Gregory, um, Sylvia Andiel, um, Emily Bezik, um, Dr Lilia Andrianova and Dr Annika Bolt for their participation today. Um, there are profiles of all of today's panellists on the website including details of their Twitter accounts um, and thank you all for listening and please remember to like, comment and subscribe and tell us about your own work. So thank you all very much. Brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world.